This rule of analytical inquiry arouses frequently the opposition of intellectuals, as I have experienced them in discussions, because they insist on the right to give to words the meanings which they want. The existence of a standard based on the historical fact that words do not lie around in the language, but are created by thinkers for the expression of experiences when they have them, is fervently rejected. They prefer what I call the Humpty Dumpty philosophy of language, where the determination of meaning for a word is the exercise of the intellectual's power, which must not be submitted to criticism. Considerable help in understanding the processes of deformation has come to me through the observation of these processes by the great Austrian romanciers, especially by Gütersloh, Musil and Dodera. They have created the term second reality in order to signify the image of reality created by human beings when they exist in a state of alienation. The principal characteristic of the state of alienation, which then is supported by the imaginative construction of second realities in opposition to the reality of experience, is what Dodere has called a refusal to apperceive, the apperceptionsverweigerung, a concept which has been developed by him in his novel Die Dämonen, and I always enjoy the fact that he developed the concept in the observation of certain sexual aberrations. The concept of apperceptionsverweigerung is formally developed in the introductory remarks to the chapter on the dicken Damen, the fat ladies, which are in favor with one of his heroes. The refusal to apperceive has become for me the central concept for the understanding of ideological aberrations and deformations. It appears in a variety of phenomena, of which the historically most interesting one is the formal interdict on questioning demanded by Kant and Marx. If anybody should question the ideological doctrine of these ideological systematizers in the name of questions for the reality of the divine ground of reality, he will be informed by Kant that he should not ask lazy questions question oiseuse, and by Marx that he should shut up and become a socialist man, in quotation marks, socialist man. This attitude of not permitting questions regarding the premises of ideological systems, questions which would immediately explode the system, is the general tactics employed by ideologists in discussion. In numerous conversations with Hegelians, for instance, I have always come to the point where I had to question the premises of alienated existence which lie at the basis of Hegel's speculation. Whenever this question comes up, I am informed by the respective Hegelian that I do not understand Hegel and that one can understand Hegel only if one does not ask questions regarding his premises. As soon as one understands the interdict on questions as a central tactic of all ideological debate, one arrives at at least one important criterion of all ideologies, the criterion being the question what part of reality has been excluded in order to make the construction of a fake system possible. The reality excluded can extend to various areas, but the one that uniformly has to be excluded is the experience of man's existence in tension toward the divine ground of existence that he is not himself.
Once the consciousness of existential tension is recognized as the critical experience, which an ideologist must exclude if he wants to make his own state of alienation compulsory for everybody. The problem of consciousness, in the sense of the consciousness of this tension, moves into the center of philosophical thought. The understanding of both classic and Christian philosophy, as well as of the ideological deformations of existence, center in the understanding of consciousness in the fullness of its dimensions. The characteristic of what may be called the, in quotation marks, modern conception of consciousness is the construction of consciousness by the model of sense perceptions of objects in external reality. This restriction of the model of consciousness to objects of external reality is a more or less hidden trick in the construction of systems in the 19th century. Even in Hegel, one can observe in his phenomenology that he begins with sense perception and from the analysis of sense perception develops all strata in the structure of consciousness. The Hegelian case is especially remarkable because Hegel was one of the greatest connoisseurs of the history of philosophy. And he knew, of course, that the primary experiences of consciousness, as they appear in the work of the philosophers, have not to do with sense perceptions, but with the experience of structures, as for instance mathematical structures, and the experience of the turning toward the divine ground of existence, motivated by the pull coming from this ground that motivates man to turn toward him. I have not the slightest doubt that a man of the historical knowledge of Hegel deliberately ignored the immediate experiences of consciousness and replaced them by the highly abstract and historically very late models of perception of objects in the external world in order to put over a system that reflected his state of alienation. I do not know of any passage in Hegel where he becomes explicit on his own technique of intellectual fraud, but it has become explicit in the work of Marx in the Paris manuscripts. If the experience of objects in the external world, which is one area of reality experienced, is absolutized into the structure of consciousness at large, all spiritual and intellectual phenomena connected with the experience of divine reality are automatically excluded, or if they cannot be excluded because, after all, they are the history of mankind, must be deformed into propositions about a transcendent reality. This propositional deformation of the philosophers and prophets' symbols is one of the important phenomena in the history of mankind. It is already in the making in high scholastic philosophy and in the transition to modern metaphysics in Descartes. And this deformation is then continued as a sort of secondary orthodoxy by the ideological thinkers. That propositional metaphysics is a deformation of philosophy and must develop into ideology because the reality about which the propositions are made does not exist as an object and therefore sooner or later the propositions which supposedly are about an object are found to be nonsensical. I consider one of the more important findings in my work. But once this problem is recognized, the question arises, why do human beings engage in the games of propositional metaphysics and the successor orthodoxies of the ideologies? And why do we have, therefore, the phenomenon of the great modern dogma Tomachis from the 16th century onward, now going on for more than 400 years, without a noticeable return to the pre-dogmatic reality of experience. This question leads to 
the further problem of alienation and the state of alienation which expresses itself in the deformation of symbols into doctrines. The matter is of course not new. The deformations in classic antiquity began to become socially dominant as soon as the earlier shells of symbols became invalid with the destructions of the society which had engendered them through the empires. With the Stoics and their observation of existential disorder in the wake of imperial conquests begins the understanding of alienation, beginning with the creation of the term, in parentheses, allotriosis. That is the, Greek term. the Stoics, being well-trained philosophers themselves, understood the phenomenon of alienation quite well. If philosophical existence is existence in awareness of man's humanity constituted by his tension towards the divine ground, and if this awareness is in the practice of existence realized by the Platonic periagogy, the turning towards the ground, then alienation is the turning away from the ground towards a self which is imagined to be human without being constituted by its relation to the Divine Presence. The turning toward the Divine Ground, the classic epistrophe, is therefore to be supplemented in the description of human reality by the Stoic's conception of the apostrophe, the turning away from the ground. Turning toward and turning away from the ground becomes the fundamental categories descriptive of human existence regarding its order and disorder. These fundamental observations of the Stoics concerning the structure of existence tie in with the previously mentioned modern observations on the refusal to apperceive. Turning away means to refuse to apperceive the divine ground as constitutive of man's reality. This willful turning away from the fundamental area of reality was classified by the Stoics as a disease of the mind. Psychopathology as the science of existential deformation through turning away from the ground and thereby the withdrawal from one's own self has become the core of psychopathology and has remained so well into the Renaissance. The question has come to the fore again in the 20th century because the mass phenomena of spiritual and intellectual disorientation in our time have attracted attention again to the fundamental act of apostrophe. After finding the causes of disorder in a variety of secondary symptoms like an undisciplined expansion of the passions one discovers now again in existential psychology that back of the secondary symptoms which involves the release of passions, there stands the fundamental problem of the apostrophe and the withdrawal from one's own humanity. Again, the phenomenon of the rediscovery just described is not singular in the modern period. We can observe the same phenomenon already in the classic Greek period, when the observation of social pathology couched by Thucydides in the medical terms of the Hippocratic school became the basis for the discovery of existential order by Plato and Aristotle.